thank you very much for having us this morning. Um, we're excited to be here. Um, so uh, my name is Ben Kampkin. I'm based at University College London, and I'm going to be presenting with Lo Marshall, who's uh, with me today, who's a research fellow. And we both work on a project called Night, Night Spaces, Migration, Culture and Integration in Europe with other colleagues who are going to be presenting in this conference. But today, uh, we're going to talk about some of our earlier work, um, and Lowe's going to introduce some findings from a project that we've been working on since 2016, which is looking at LGBTQ night spaces. Um, and then I'm going to analyze a specific urban development that I've been uh, looking at uh, for a book that I'm writing, which develops from the earlier scoping work that we did uh, around LGBTQ nightlife spaces. And this is a case where there's a major train infrastructure project called Crossrail, um, uh, which uh, in 2006 was the first time that the City Hall in London recognized the threat to an LGB, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual night venue within a development context. Uh, and it was also a very high profile um, uh, uh, case of online activism to try and protect a club from development. Mm -hmm. So I hope that yeah, our slides are showing. So, um, Lo, are you able to move the slides on for me, if that's okay? Because otherwise I'm just switching between the screens. Uh, yep, I yeah, can okay. do that, no Great. problem. Okay, so to give some background to our research, uh, by 2015, 2016, which was when we started, there was widespread reporting um, and concern around LGBTQ spaces in London closing and being increasingly under threat. But evidence of what was happening on the ground was quite isolated and anecdotal. Um, but pointed to the acceleration of a kind of longer term phenomenon. And for meaningful intervention to be made by the Greater London Authority, which is City Hall basically, and local councils, a more robust evidence base was needed. So we co-designed a pilot research project with two campaign groups called RAISE and Queer Spaces Network. And we look back to 1986, when the Greater London Council was disbanded, which ended a period of active support for lesbian and gay activism. And it, this moment also marked a real shift towards the neoliberalization of urban regeneration policy. And it was around this time that we began the research in 2016 that Amy LeMay was appointed the Night Tower of London under the new mayor, Sadiq Khan. And having presented our research findings to the mayor's culture team, we were commissioned by them to develop our database of venues, uh, venue openings and closures, and our case studies of licensed premises, which focus on those that have operated full time as LGBTQ spaces, um, and looking specifically at the decade from 2006 onwards. So in the second phase of research, we showed that the number of LGBTQ venues that had closed in London, um, there was a fall of 58%. So that was from 121 to 51. Uh, where information was available, the evidence suggested that closures, closures were often the consequence of these longer term urban processes driving urban change, such as redevelopment and gentrification. And the number of venues closing uh, due to business releases finances was actually quite low and especially this was the case in our more high profile closures and threatened spaces. Of course, LGBTQ spaces are enormously valuable to the communities who use them, particularly in terms of finding community, belonging, exploring gender and sexuality, and fostering queer cultures. And importantly, they offer space away from homophobia, transphobia, and social isolation that many experience outside of those spaces. And thinking about this wider context is really important in understanding the value of queer spaces. But also LGBTQ spaces aren't ex equally accessible and inclusive to everyone who shelters under the LGBTQ umbrella. And like other types of venue, they can be actively exclusive, so oriented towards a specific group, um, or unintentionally exclusive by being physically inaccessible or extremely loud, for example. They also vary in terms of commercial model and outlook to LGBTQ communities, which would be clear in uh, Ben's part of the presentation later. 
Some LGBTQ spaces have a mixed clientele, but they have largely been operated and predominantly used by white, cisgender, gay identifying men. Nightlife spaces created specifically by and for uh, women, trans people and people of colour have largely taken place as events and there are some examples of some events here. Um, and of course these uh, identities are not mutually exclusive, that is women, trans people and people of colour. And when I say people of colour, um, in the UK context and in America it's used to describe racial minorities, racialized minorities and this includes British people, migrants, and people with multiple nationalities. So this phenomena of predominantly event-based nightlife is partly due to closures, particularly where women's spaces are concerned, but it also reflects this longer term pattern where that, um, it's down to barriers to property ownership and wider socioeconomic inequalities um, that are found in London and the UK more broadly. And mainly, many of these events actively respond also to factors that are considered to be lacking, problematic or exclusionary in permanent um, LGBTQ venues. For example, racism, classism, ableism, sexism, biphobia and transphobia. I'll pass over to Ben here. Thank you. So our research has shown how diverse LGBTQ plus communities have been successful particularly in embedding themselves through their night spaces in infrastructural sites that are associated with past phases of London's urbanisation. Um, so for example, uh, Victorian stables or railway infrastructures, uh, those kinds of spaces. Uh, and also that venues and events for LGBT communities constitute a kind of queer infrastructure for nightlife, a term that I'm using in the book that I'm writing at the moment to communicate how these venues and the populations that assemble uh, in them and use them transmit resources across time and space through night, night, nighttime venues. So opportun often opportunistically located, these venues are often in precarious sites uh, and rundown buildings and they inhabit uh, breaks in the development cycle and, and take advantage of those breaks in the redev redevelopment cycle. Um, LGBTQ plus venues of all types, like other cultural spaces, are therefore vulnerable once the development cycle accelerates, just like other types of cultural space. They are often threatened or, limited or eliminated through practices of urban densification, through large scale infrastructure, roads, bridges, stations, and also real retail led projects which are all incentivized at the national level in planning at the metropolitan level and also at the local level as part of uh, global city strategies the profound and contradictory ways that lgbtq plus venues are networked into processes of urbanization are apparent in the case of the still unfolding major infrastructure redevelopment crossrail around a station called Tottenham Court Road in central London. This is a new deep tunnel regional express line project which is overdue for completion which runs from Heathrow Airport across uh, into the capital. This has been led by public bodies Network Rail and Transport for London. Network Rail uh, as a landowner as a public body has frequently owned and managed uh, land and buildings leased for cultural and community uses uh, including LGBTQ plus venues and events. Uh, but its record as a landlord is varied and has positives and negative aspects. Um, it encourages uh, nightlife users at particular moments in the, in the gentrification cycle, but also uh, uh, eradicates opportunities at other points. And actually the, the image that we're using for our backdrop today is a, is a club in a Victorian railway arch, Block South, uh, which is now closed, which was in a network rail uh, building as well. So Crossrail has unfolded over a long period of time as these types of projects do. And during this time, the legislative and policy framework on sexual orientation and equality in the UK has undergone significant change. Like most publicly funded infrastructure projects, uh, the, the scheme itself is framed through its benefits, public benefits for regeneration and framed in terms of inclusion. 
but it also has contradictory effects on particular communities. Uh, and in a, in a clear way, it was antagonistic to the direction of LGBTQ plus equalities governance at the time in the mid 2000s uh, in City Hall, when e equalities under sexual orientation were being mainstreamed into urban governance, driven by European equalities directives and also new British legislation. So following Transport for London's equality guide, guidance, which was the equality policy that uh, governed this project, the project included an equalities impact screening. And this is a process which allows public bodies to determine potential negative impacts of development on specified minority groups who have a protected status. Uh, and in the policy uh, discussions at the time, uh, this included the uh, a category of sexual orientation, lesbian, gay and bisexual populations. So here, the assessment identified a potential negative impact from the development of a venue uh, on the development of a venue used extensively by the lesbian, gay and bisexual community. And actually, this was the first attempt by City Hall to name a threat of a negative impact to a group under a category of uh, sexual, a sexual minority. Um, and the threat in particular was to the capital's biggest and most stridently commercial gay club night, which was called GAY and was hosted at uh, a long term venue, the Astoria, a music venue and club venue. Um, so, in fact, GAY wasn't really a venue. It was a, it was an event, um, but it had quite a strong uh, foothold in the, the London uh, nightlife environment. An earlier threat to GOI had provoked the first, as far as we're aware, uh, the first online petition to protect an LGBT space threatened by urban development in the London context. Uh, and this gained over 16,000 signatures. Although here planning processes identified the threat to one venue, uh, classifying the venue as a leisure space, business and property, the equalities impact assessment didn't demonstrate any understanding of the function or community value of a lesbian, gay and bisexual venue, uh, nor of why City Hall might be concerned about the loss of an established venue. This was in 2006. Um, and they didn't show any awareness either that there was actually a broader cluster of LGBTQ venues around the development, as you saw in the earlier slide. Uh, although this wasn't mentioned, the venue was significant as the location for London's first big gay club night, uh, Bang, uh, which ran from 1976 to 1993 uh, and moved to the Astoria in the 1980s. And GAY, the, the, the night that would later be identified by uh, the city authorities for protection, uh, was run by a promoter called Jeremy Joseph, a gay man who had worked at Bang uh, and then acquired Bang, uh, bought the rights to Bang, and changed the name to GAY, uh, and then hosted this night at the Astoria uh, for uh, two nights per week from 1993 until it closed in 2008. So from its okay, thank you. From its roots in Bang, in the basement Sundown Club of the Astoria, to its success as a high-profile multi-city franchise. GAY embodies the trajectory of assimilation from subculture to the mainstream. From the point of view of City Hall, you could see why it was a dilemma. The site being developed was part of a big infrastructure and retail development, but on the other hand, it was also the home of this very successful nightlife business, uh, but also associated with a sexual minority who they wanted to uh, protect and had policies on including. So this uh, but this experience of GAY contrasts with the experiences of other smaller scale and less commercial venues in the vicinity, which had a lighter foothold than uh, Jeremy Joseph and GAY in the properties they occupied and which fell outside of the assessment process. So, for example, First Out Cafe, which opened in 1986 and closed in 2011, and is where London's nights are used to work as a waitress, is another notable impacted venue. Here again, the community protested with a petition um, and actually this site, they'd only been able to open this space because it was already a site that was earmarked for development even in the 1980s. Um, 
but eventually they uh, were forced to close because of the development. So here, a group of young socialists had set up a workers' cooperative for lesbians and gay men. They came up with this new typology of a continental style day and nighttime vegetarian cafe with a bar, with an exhibition space, which did uh, club nights as well. Um, and in a way, it was a kind of antidote to the commercial nightlife scenes at the time. It was a community space not centered around alcohol consumption or sex. Um, so rather than a kind of impulsive form of entrepreneurialism, this was a very careful form of entrepreneurialism that was geared towards particular social need. Um, and they were very careful in uh, gaining diplomatic support from the city authorities, from the local authority and so on to set this up. And it became a very diverse space and um, hosted trans groups for older and younger groups, Sikh groups, Gay Alcoholics Anonymous, Life Drawing um, and, and so on. But eventually uh, it had to close because of the construction blight around the Crossrail development, even though there was this massive outpouring of community support for the venue. Uh, this also contrasts with the way in which uh, music heritage more generally was thought about in this development context, where um, by the early 1990s, there was a recognition of the subcultural musical heritage of this neighborhood. And this was thought about in the development. And so there was a reprovision of a, of a venue uh, to replace uh, some of the space for grass music, roots music venues that were being eliminated. Uh, and again, this was framed in terms of inclusion, but there was no discussion around the specific LGBTQ heritage that was being eliminated. Okay, so just to bring this to a close, thank you, Jordi. Um, the, under the current mayor, Sadiq Khan, following a, a quite a dramatic crisis of closures in 2015, which Lo mentioned, and after a period of very extensive activism by communities to protect and reopen queer spaces, licensed LGBTQ venues have now been categorized as social and cultural infrastructure in policy discussions in London. And this designation points to the ways that different venues provide important resources for marginalized groups. It highlights how the governance of the night heritage and diversity are now being approached in a more integrated way than they were in the 2000s, um, albeit through the crude tools and systems of categorization that planning uses. Beyond physical spaces, venues are facilitated through and extended by other materialities, communications technologies, economic cycles, urban governance, property dynamics, and these factors working at different speeds shape their differential qualities. Licensed premises are only the most visible surface of London's queer infrastructure, but they're nonetheless a useful gauge to understand the processes of social and cultural reproduction of LGBTQ plus populations across the city and across different generations. So thank you very much. Um, we haven't had time to talk through it, but on that last slide, um, we're just pointing to some of the current policy instruments that are being used to try and protect these spaces. Um, and we're happy to talk about those with anyone that's interested afterwards. So thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Are, yeah, just, you can find these publications online as well if you're interested. Ah, nice. Okay. Okay. If you want to, to, to send a link, for example, in the chat and people, okay. Sure. Thank we'll you do very that. much, Ben. Thank, thank you very you. much. Hello. And um, it's just time for uh, Diana. Are you here, Diana? Yep. Okay. Oh. Fantastic. So I will do a quick screen share, just a second. All right, can folks see this okay? Great. So good morning and, and thank you to Jordan and the whole team for convening us here. Um, this is truly a really, really international group and I'm, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you all. So um, my research, team member um, Kai Saxa and I um, have been working on um, looking at Clubsterben in Berlin and um, this the first time the word Clubsterben appeared in anywhere um, in the German news media first was 2001 um, and that this conversation has really evolved over the over the course of the last um, 20 years but especially in the last decade um, and this real interest in, in this conversation began as well this year um, with the high profile closure of the Griesmüller Club um, in Berlin. And so um, 
this is a work in progress. And I think we, we had one notion of, of this conversation and of defining the threats to Berlin club culture and also how nighttime governance actors can respond prior to COVID-19. Um, and of course, this research topic has changed a lot in the last few months and will certainly continue to um, between now and September and beyond. And so uh, we'll share a couple of case studies and some of our preliminary findings, um, but this is a, definitely a work in progress still. And we're looking forward to being in conversation with, with you all here today. And so before we dive in, um, I want to add a couple of definitions to the conversation um, because I know this can sometimes be uh, rather open-ended. So how we define clubs. Um, this is a, a definition from a club culture study that came out in 2019 that we're borrowing from. A club is a venue that is characterized by a program focused on live music, by restricted access of a certain nature to create a protected space with its own rules, and by a community that meets there to listen to music, to dance, and to socialize. So when we, when we talk about clubs and club culture, we're talking about these three elements of physical spaces that revolve around programming and that produce a certain scene and community. Um, and this is certainly in line with and informed by um, Ben and Lowe's work um, and so on as we're talking about uh, vulnerabilities to, to these kinds of spaces. And so we want to offer um, a definition of Klubsterben because this is a, a topic that has been discussed in, in tons of media um, and by many different actors, but there isn't necessarily one agreed upon definition. So clubs, as, as we've discussed in the previous presentation as well, may close for any number of reasons. Um, clubs must be in balance in aesthetic and social and economic dimensions. And when any one of those dimensions falls out of balance, that can lead to uh, struggles for the business and ultimately closure. And so that may include rent rises, that may include changing tastes. Um, but we primarily focused on in gathering our case studies, Club Sherbin as venue closure due to external causes, despite a still functioning economic, aesthetic, and social concept. So clubs that were still functioning and still healthy um, on those three metrics, but had some external cause um, pushing that closure. So I'll turn it over to Kai right now to talk a bit about how we came up with some of our case studies and to start that off. Thank you very much. And I'm also very excited to present our work here. So our work focuses, or our research focuses on identifying those factors and processes that cause venues to close and also identifying the responses from politics and nighttime organizations. So for that, we use a case study methodology trying to uh, identify the causes of effects and tracing the processes that led to venue closures. So we looked at several cases of venue closures during the last decade, and we used materials such as press coverage, policy documentations, also court verdicts or political proposals, as well as conducting qualitative interviews with club owners. Um, can you put the next slide, please? Yes, so there is many, many cases of club closures in the last decade. There is also other cases that are not on the slide, like anti and or Rosie's and also pending cases currently. But those four are definitely one, uh, some that we will look into. And today we're going to focus on the two above, which is one Knark Club, which existed from 1952 to 2010, was very well institutionalized venue. Also, the closure was very well document, uh, documented because it involved two court cases. And John Knüppel, which was more a DIY space uh, existing from 2015 to 2018, which was then very uh, publicly discussed also the closure. So let's dive into the first case, which is Knack Look. You can see a couple of pictures on the left. Uh, it is a picture from the GDR, because in the GDR it was a youth center and a disco. And then after the reunification in Germany, it became very well known in the rock scene. It had several dance floors, one concert floor where also big bands like Dammstein and Die Toten Hosen played. And it was yeah, very well known and very institutionalized 
known all along the country. Um, its location was in Prenzlauer Berg, which is widely known as the center of gentrification. A lot of um, renovations and new apartment development took place during that time. Here on the map, we see the direct environment uh, where the club was. The club is marked with a K. And in 2005, the authorities handed out two building permits for residential development um, very close to the club, one in the northeast, which is marked green, and one in the southwest, which is marked red. Um, so being aware of the pro uh, problem and being able to see construction activity from their windows to the northeast in the green window and uh, the green box, the operators successfully filed a complaint against construction going on there so, and were able to stop this construction. Two years later, construction started uh, in the red box um and this was not visible to the operators because it was on the back wall so no windows connected and they didn't see any activity but soon after the new neighbors moved in in 2008 noise complaints were uh, coming and the authorities reduced volume and some people say it was more like background music playing in the store. It would really reduce volume. So in order to be able to operate again on the normal circumstances, the club filed a legal complaint um, against the residential development. A court ruled that the building permit was inconsiderate because it didn't offer soundproofing and uh, it should take the, the club's activity into, into consideration. And also the court ruled that the complaint was filed in time because um, the, the club owners obtained knowledge of the residential development after the first noise complaint. Later that year, in 2010, a higher court ruled that the uh, right to objection was forfeited because the club should have obtained knowledge of the building permit when a crane was operating during the construction back in 2008. So they were not able to operate on full volume, which ultimately led to an audience drop and the closure in, uh, after New Year's Eve 2010. So what we can learn from that case is that noise and especially gentrification and new neighbors connected to noise complaints can be a big problem and that there is a need for clear communication with the administration and authorities because there was and also uh, a need to raise awareness about the interests of clubs because they didn't take the club's operation into account when handing out the building permits. And I'm now I'm going to hand over to Diana to present the second case. Yeah, so we'll, we'll touch briefly on um, some of the, the ways that nighttime advocates learned from cases like this and tools that they implemented. Um, but here I also want to mention this is a, a quite different case. So club culture often exists on a spectrum of rather institutionalized and professionalized spaces to more informal as well as spaces that are more publicly well-known and versus underground. And so while Kanak was certainly um, a more institutional and very long-standing space, um, Johnny Knuppel was more of a, a, a DIY and informal space and with a multidisciplinary program. So it ranged from jazz and big bands to theater to techno and disco and also played home to other collectives in the community. Um, our conversations with, with folks who helped to create the space and folks who attended the space described it as something of an Alice in Wonderland feeling um, that was sort of constantly in creation. And so this, this case is particularly significant. Um, part of the dramaturgy of that space was, is where it, it existed on the Low Moulin in So, which is a, a peninsula um, that simultaneously is in one of the most densely populated areas for nightlife in Berlin, um, right next to Kreuzberg, just to, to the west, but also it's still uh, zoned industrial. And so this is really characteristic of nightlife spaces that aim to be in the center of the city, near its audiences, near transit, but also in places where they're less likely to disturb potential neighbors, especially residential with noise. 
And so for the first two years of Johnny Knuppel's operation, um, they operated quite successfully and were also working in a continuous and often really costly process um, to get fully permitted with both city and district level offices. And both of these cases are, are rather complex. So recognize that we are simplifying in these cases, but happy to go into greater detail later on. Um, but two unforeseen events in the summer of 2017 um, threw the space into a little bit more of a vulnerable position. Um, first, oddly enough, um, despite the industrial zoning, there is actually a residential building on this peninsula. And so noise complaints escalated in a way that the operators didn't recognize in advance. Um, and also uh, an electrical fire via another group in the space put this informal and DIY space on the radar of officials and the public in a way that it wasn't before. Um, their permit was pulled until they were able to make necessary safety and sound upgrades. And however, without an income, um, that pushed them to launch a crowdfunding campaign um, in order to raise the necessary money. That, that happened. Um, they were able to raise about 80,000 euro um, despite being closed. And um, they were able to, to get really a lot of public and also political support. Um, construction began on those upgrades, but unfortunately that is the point, um, and this is very much in line with the, the presentation that we just heard, where their landlord declined to renew their lease. And so that was regarded as perhaps um, the growing publicity and the growing popularity of a space um, somewhere that was all, always intended to be a temporary or an interim use um, really put that space into conflict with, uh, with a property owner that perhaps would want to use that space for something else later on um, and, and considered possibly a, a longer term issue further down the line. So a couple of the key themes that are coming up for us in both of these cases, as well as others we're looking at, um, is this role of noise, um, especially as residential development intensifies in an area, resulting in um, community conflicts. Additionally, this lack of understanding or a lack of shared process or language between clubs and city and district administrations can really be complicated, whether that's needing to have information earlier on, um, like in the case of Knack, or being able to successfully advocate and negotiate um, public processes like in Johnny Knuppel. Um, additionally, we're looking at the role of visibility, how political pressure can be helpful in some cases, and how with more informal spaces especially, it can potentially actually be harmful. Um, but the larger context this sits in, of course, thank you, um, is, is club's temporary use status. So while cultural space is on um, temporary uh, zoning or, or property owners consider it to be an in-between use, um, how complicated that can be. And I know we're very short on time, so we'll briefly just show these and maybe at Kai you can share, just breathe a brief. Um, sorry, that's two tools the Berlin Senate in cooperation with Club Commission introduced. On the left, we see the Club Katasta, it's a map um, which connects the venue locations of clubs with development plans and also renewal plans and new buildings. So it is able to provide an early warning system for clubs to participate in city development processes. And second, the Lärmschutz Fund, which is a noise protection fund, um, which offers funding for clubs for their sound protection, especially in cases of uh, ongoing noise conflict. And also, there is uh, recently a big discussion about the designation of clubs as cultural spaces, which reached the German federal parliament and now as well the um, Berlin Parliament, where the governing parties uh, introduced the proposal to recognize clubs as cultural spaces, to also support this initiative on a federal level, and to um, support the projects of Club Katasta and Lamschutz for even more. So, of course, um, this is important work before, but the unquestioned uh, Supporting corona closures makes all of this um, even more urgent. The question of clubs as cultural spaces versus entertainment spaces has a really key application in where these businesses and where these cultural institutions um, are receiving funding or receiving support 
especially as it looks like club venues in Berlin and other cities may be some of the last to reopen. So we'll leave it there. Um, and thank you so much. And we'll pass it on to the next. Thank you very much, yeah, Diana right. and Kay. It's amazing. And yeah, there are a lot of questions even in a comparative approach between London and Berlin and it's the uh, next presentation. No? Around the new way for urban development and speculation and so on. Okay, so um, yes, uh, it's time now for um, Catherine. Catherine, are you here? Are you here, Catherine? Catherine? Yeah. Yeah, hello. So it's your time. Great, thank you. Okay, so morning, everybody. Um, thank you for including me in this panel. What follows is a series of uh, reflections on a kind of unresolved question and one that adds maybe a, a different take on the two interesting papers that we've had this morning. An inexistent architecture. That's how the Italian architect Carlo Caldini described the interior of Space Electronic, the nightclub he designed as part of Gruppo 9999 in Florence in 1969. His description of the club, a black box container, was an articulation radical at the time that nightclub architecture was not made through the tangible mute materials of bricks and mortar, but rather through artificial lighting and sound and through the bodies, through these bodies they enveloped. This phrase, inexistent architecture, is at the core of what I want to talk about today, how to preserve and promote club culture through exhibition making. And it's absolutely clubs as cultural spaces that I'm um, interested in. Now, until recently, Nightclubs such as Space Electronic have been largely overlooked in the histories of architecture and design. This is despite their rich creative and cultural contribution, as settings for multidisciplinary design activity that then feed out into the wider world, as sites for experimentation in graphics, lighting, sound, interior design, and more, as stages for performance for new identities, new fashions. So to take Space Electronic as one example, the venue was the setting for everything from live jazz to performances from the American avant-garde group Living Theatre, who performed naked on the dance floor, to an architectural festival in which Grupo 9999 turned the club's basement into a lake and planted a vegetable garden on the dance floor. Now, in recent years, the stories of Space Electronic and other remarkable venues have started to come to light through publications, but also a notable surge in exhibitions both in the UK and elsewhere. So to name just a few, which you can see on the slide, uh, Bois de Nuit on the uh, left, uh, which was a small scale but rich survey of club culture at the Arche in Southern France in 2017. Sweet Harmony, Rave Today at London Saatchi Gallery. Queer Spaces, London 1980s to today at London's Whitechapel Gallery, co-curated by Ben Campkin. Into the Night, Cabarets and Clubs in Modern Art, which was a collaboration between London's Barbican Art Gallery and Vienna's Belvedere. Excavating the Reno at Manchester's Whitworth Gallery, which told the story of a small funk and soul club in the city. Electro at the Philharmonie de Paris, which is set to open this July as Electronic at London's Design Museum. And Studio 54, Night Magic, which opened at Brooklyn Museum in January. This is where I confess my interest is not just as a visitor. I've actually curated and co-curated my own exhibitions in this area, something which actually started it with Space Electronic, the subject of a small installation I curated for the 2014 Venice Architecture Biennale, and then expanded to look at other venues designed by Italian architects at the time for a co-curated show at London's Institute of Contemporary Arts. And then in 2018, I co-curated my third and most recent offering and largest endeavour in this field, which is Night Fever, Designing Club Culture 1962 Today, which opened a um, touring exhibition which opened at Vitra Design Museum in Germany, has gone to Brussels, uh, Prato, and is currently on ice, as I like to think of it, in Copenhagen before it moves on again. Now, there are a few questions that come to mind when considering this flurry of ex exhibition activity, and one of them is why now? What is it about the past five years or so that have prompted such intense curatorial activity? This is in part about the life cycle of subcultures, the time it takes for a movement to go from underground to mainstream to a history ripe for critical appraisal or nostalgic indulgence. It is also about the aging demographic of a subcultural tribe 
who now find themselves going to see museums about clubs they used to haunt rather than the clubs themselves. There's also been a trend led in the UK by the BNA for so-called blockbuster immersive exhibitions on popular music culture that kind of is part of this story. So 2007 um, Kylie exhibition started this, then um, David Barry in 2013, Pink Floyd in 2017, but other exhibitions such as ABBA at London South Bank and Punk, which was a kind of quite visceral exhibition um, at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. So it's partly part of this trend, but it's also connected with the changing fortunes of club culture itself that we've heard actually expressed maybe more elegantly this morning. So the UK, as elsewhere, has faced several challenges to club culture in recent years. So to give some kind of different, different um, examples of statistics, between 2005 and 2016, over half of UK clubs closed. And between 2001 and 2017, nearly a third of London's, uh, London's nightclubs closed. And most of us familiar, we've heard already the kind of cocktail of reasons given from gentrification to challenges presented by planning, licensing, legislation, to changing social behaviours, the rise of digital dating apps. But even in this time, the picture has changed. So during the two years that we were working on night fever, some closure rates stabilised and we saw the, the, green route, the green shoots of new clubs and new types of clubs emerging from spaces such as London Print, print Print works, which is a kind of massive venue, but actually ultimately owned by a property developer whose programming includes daytime raves, to another London venue called Oval Space Pickle Factory, which includes co-working spaces and it is embedded in the creative community of East London. And of course, the ongoing rise of clubs as an event or mobile kind of endeavour, taking the guise of festivals, exercise classes or museum lates. So it's not just the closures which prompt critical attention, but also the shifts within the sector. This is a moment of change and so a moment of reflection and appraisal. And given the low heritage status of the, of the UK's club culture, such exhibitions become vital, as through the process of collecting and exhibiting artefacts, museums of course endow value on the cultures these artefacts belong to. Exhibitions can be part of the preservation and promotion of club culture, a cross-sector collaboration I am interested in. The challenge though for curators is what are the artefacts to ex exhibit and how do you present them? Much of the surviving objects of club culture are flat. They are flyers, posters, invitations, which can make for a literally flat exhibition. And finding even these, ex these artifacts can be challenging when they're comparatively minimal archives and collections. But it's also about the specificity of club culture. What exactly is it that you're exhibiting? And this is where I come back to where I started, to Caldini's comment on the spatial singularity of the nightclub, because the architect wasn't the only voice to point this out. So in his opening to 1997's Queer Space, Architecture and Same-Sex Desire, the architecture critic and curator Aaron Betsky describes the experience of going to New York Studio 54. I've got the quote here. Instead of walls, floors and ceilings, here was a space that appeared and disappeared continually. Instead of places of privacy where design was unwanted and public spaces where architecture had to appear in a correct guise, here was a place where the most intimate acts, whether real or acted out in dance, occurred in full view through a structure of lights, sounds and arrangements that made it all seem natural. Instead of references to buildings or painting, instead of a grammar and of ornament and a syntax of facades, here was only rhythm and light. Rhythm and light, for me that's another way of saying inexistent architecture or what Ivan Lopez Munera writing for our Night Fever catalogue called Discotecture. To an architecture that made of the technologies of sound and light, the researcher Paul Estev adds another technology to the mix, psychotropic drugs, which also uses experiences of and behaviour within the architecture, and so to an extent, the architecture itself. So the architecture and design of clubs is in part about technology, but it's also about what happens as a result of these technologies. This is what Simon Reynolds, who is a British music critic, journalist and author, has written about in Energy Flash, his uh, history of UK rave music. 
He talks about, he kind of states that rave culture can't really be documented. And he attributes this to the non-verbal nature of rave music. So he compares it to rock music being centered around lyrics, but this isn't true of rave. So this means, as he says, that you no longer ask what the music means, but how it works. And so while rock, rock music might describe an experience, rave music constructs one. He calls this the effective charge of rave music. And actually, I think this, is, this idea of the effective charge is really useful for how we understand objects such as lighting and sound devices and how to present them in an exhibition. We cannot simply put lumps of technology on a plinth. We have to feel their effect. We have to experience them. So what, what I want to do next is to turn from this brief theorizing to talk equally briefly about some exhibitions I mentioned at the beginning. How did they tackle this curatorial challenge? So first, Sweet Harmony, which took place at London's Saatchi Gallery, and which presented a combination of art installations and period photography from artists and photographers involved in the scene, including Conrad Shawcross and Vinka Peterson. Now, Peterson's contributions included a handwritten autobiographical diary of the rave scene that ran the full length of an extensive gallery wall, and a full-size bouncy castle which she takes to orphanages and schools across the world, a legacy of the life filling, uh, fulfilling collective joy she found in the rave scene. However, the sign requesting visitors to not jump on the bouncy castle, illustrated with the smiley face of rave culture, exemplified the problem of making it an exhibition about experience when you can't let people access those experiences. Transplanting the real artifacts of club culture into a gallery needs to take into account the different behaviours allowed in each. Next up is Into the Night, the London-Vienna collaboration, which examined cabarets, clubs, cafes and bars from the 1880s to the 1960s in cities including Berlin, Mexico City, Rome and Tehran. And the show is broadly divided into two parts. The, the first part is kind of fascinating but fairly conventional in its um, in terms of his examination of individual clubs through historical material located in vitrines. But the second section that you see the photographs here was more dramatic. The curators staged recreations of four historical venues, including the Joseph Hoffman designed bar at Vienna's Fledermaus from 1907 and a composite representation of two Mbari clubs from Nigeria in the 1960s. Now, these spaces were ambitious in scale and effort. There were 7,000 individually made um, ceramic tiles for the venue on the left. So they were ambitious and to stand in them was memorable, but they were also memorable for what they lacked. The bodies, the heat, the clamour of sounds, the multiplicity of lights. So can recreation ever succeed in capturing the story of these spaces? For Night Fever, we took a different tack again. As you might expect, we also filled vitrines with historical artefacts, with flyers, posters, magazines, clothing, furniture, and a couple of pieces of club architecture. And for curatorial, but also economic and practical reasons, we decided to concentrate the question of inexistent architecture into one room, into an installation designed by our exhibition designer, Konstantin Gercic, and club lighting designer, Matthias Singer. They worked in conjunction with a music consultant called Stefan Erlinger, to create an audiovisual installation in which you could hear key tracks from different music genres while immersed in light projections. We called the installation Can You Feel It after the 1986 Mr Fingers track, the idea being that visitors could not just see but also hear and feel the nightclub. I don't present this last because I think this is the solution at all to, to what we're trying to talk about. And there is a slight issue with this in that it leans towards a silent disco and perhaps it's too clean a take on club culture. Visitors, you know, have to kind of move, but actually they do move. And I think there's something interesting and they start moving their bodies more as they go through the exhibition afterwards. But I think there's something in this idea of a different new experiential space, a kind of hybrid gallery club space, rather than the transplanting or the recreation of a real club space is an area that I'm interested in exploring further. So we come quickly, very quickly to the end. Outlined here are three exhibitions that focus on attempts to communicate some semblance of the atmosphere and the environment of the nightclub without ever becoming a nightclub itself. And that's a conversation we had a lot in curating the Night Fever exhibition, that we were a museum, not a nightclub. 
and I could have mentioned more such exhibitions and different curatorial approaches if time allowed. But I want to come to a close here with a reflection on what this means in this disturbing reality we find ourselves in. At present, in the UK at least, you will be able to go to an, an exhibition far sooner than you can go to a nightclub with all the economic implications that will has for, for the latter. So what role then does that mean that museums and galleries could have in protecting and promoting a nightclub culture potentially decimated by the pandemic? And where should those thirsty for club culture set their sights on going, a museum or a club? Arguably, collaboration between seemingly different cultural and creative institutions could be valuable for the future of both, so that nightclubs are not inexistent in literal as well as theoretical terms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, uh, amazing. And uh, yeah, maybe clubs are becoming museums or something like that now in the post-pandemic world. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens. Now it's time for uh, Karin. Are you here, Karin? Yes, ah, I'm here. Are you? So it's your time, please. Okay. Can you see the slide? Okay. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I uh, I'm a visual, visual anthropologist and a museum curator. And I also have some experience in uh, curating an exhibition about uh, uh, clubs, uh, more specifically uh, about uh, club and hip hop culture uh, that emerged uh, in Estonia in the beginning of 1990s. Estonia is a very small country in Eastern Europe, so it was for 50 years it was under occupied by Soviet uh, Union, so uh, there was not a lot of freedom to to do anything so kind of individualistic. Uh, so after the collapse of Soviet Union, uh, young people uh, started uh, creating nocturnal environments to which they applied their own rules. These environments were influenced by Western youth culture, but they were adapted to these very specific local conditions. Several new musical styles began to uh, shape the sound of leisure activities and nightlife. Dance music like house and techno sounded totally unlike the music that was heard on the commercial daytime uh, uh, radio. And these two young people who started developing a local version of, uh, of club culture. On 31st of August 1991, which was less than two weeks after Estonia had uh, restored independence from the Soviet Union, the first public underground dance party was held in Tallinn, Old Town. Uh, while Soviet Estonian underground punk scene in the 80s had famously been a uh, radical anti-communist uh, resistance culture, uh, then the emerging club scene in post-Soviet independent Estonia was not consciously counter-hegemonic at all. The main incentive to organize club music events was simply music, the playing it, enjoying it, creating networks to talk about it. This was repeatedly emphasized in the interviews that I conducted in 2017-18 with 14 club culture and hip-hop pioneers in Estonia. While different core meanings like uh, identity construction, self-expression, self-establishment and community creation uh, emerged from participating in the scene, these values were essentially realized through music. What was relevant for this youth, as one interviewee put it, was to play the new vinyls and throw an awesome party in the next new place. There was no authoritarian ideology anymore to protest against. And like another interview, he said, uh, at least for me and those with whom we organized these things, we didn't protest against anything. We didn't shake our fists. We wanted to make good music, listen to co uh, good music and go to cool events with good music. In Soviet Union, uh, there had been institutions that organized and controlled the uh, correct ideological entertainment of Soviet people. So, but the desire for Western, uh, Western culture was comprehensive. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, rapid integration of young people into the international youth culture took place. 
Mm. Sociologist Mario Lauristin notes that the new society offered very different social and cultural circumstances for people coming from a collectivist system of values that undermined the notion of self. She elaborates that authoritarian societies were denying the autonomy of the individual self, not recognizing individual rights and freedoms and not allowing any opportunity to feel uh, uh, for free personal choice of honest self-expression. Regarding the suppression of individual freedom and the yearning uh, for Western culture, it is emblematic that practically at the same moment when Estonia had uh, uh, restored its independence, electronic club music, uh, known for enhancing a very individual inward sensuous experience, began to make a move in Estonian urban night. Uh, Langlois describes experience, uh, experiencing such music like this. Each individual is able to concentrate on their own sensual dance world, to lose themselves in the music. In 1994, a local youth magazine described uh, the novel music experience like this. The music that you hear for the first and probably for the last time does not cease for a second, but is instead deforms, develops, loses itself and moves on. Breakbeat is seamlessly mixed with an ambient, a slick disco soul of the 70s soaks in from somewhere, somewhere that stinks from nail and rubber and varnished leather. Oh, pointless to explain. It's all crazy sensuous and it can only be conveyed in poetry. S seriously, these people are not there. Otherwise, they would hit her, their heads against the cellar's low walls. Now, neither such experience nor a description of such experience could under any circumstances be allowed only half a decade earlier. Hence, the activities within the uh, emerging scene, while not consciously counter-hegemonic, were an explicit act of dismissal of Soviet values and ideologies and signified the local youth becoming part of a much larger, more open and more individualistic world. New personal values and newly gained freedom became uh, embodied on the dance floor. Mm. One of the central notions for organizing those events was improvisation that emerged from necessity. In post-Soviet Estonia, there were simply so few material resources to do anything. However, uh, liberated from ideological control, the youth had gained an opportunity to create their own spaces of music and leisure using the available public spaces and scarce resources creatively. The country was in a fast trans transitional phase and young people were fast adapt to and use the conditions to improvise a subculture based on music and creativity. According to Stomka, after the collapse of Soviet Union, there was a strange mixture of components of various origins used to reconstruct a new social order, a post-communist culture and civilization. Such a strategy of using existing resources and mixing them uh, in unconventional, unconventional ways was applied to the emerging do-it-yourself underground club culture. As a side note, uh, house music itself is mostly based on sampling technology and recomposition of existing music. Even the making of event flyers uh, at the time could be described through this prism of sampling and mixing. Like my interview, he said, the making of flyers was freestyling like the music making was. It was a total sampling, taking a picture from somewhere, adding some texts. Mm. A lot of improvisation was needed to make use of old sound equipment that used to have completely different purposes. Uh, like these two comments from my interview, he there explain. Mm, the sound equipment was particularly bad. We mixed tracks with a very poor, poor quality Russian made console that weighed a ton, which had been scored from some communication station. It was originally meant to be used for the megaphones that blared out official announcements in cities. You could connect a number of the city loudspeakers to it at the time. Uh, very bad, but these were, were the first steps. Similarly, the party venues were often upcycled. Previous functions for many spaces in the cities had uh, been dismissed and therefore it was possible to give the spaces a new function. Uh, a quote, all these underground parties were really underground. For example, the space we started our parties in uh, the small town of Gilinginumma, it was a former shooting range. 
there was a sort of wood heater uh, inside the space, but it was damp bunnios most of the time. When we wanted to have a party, then we had to bring firewood, heat the place up for two days so that the bigger dampness and fungi was under control. Quite unsanitary and dark it was. The state of Estonian towns and cities in the beginning of the 90s reflected the overall catastrophic uh, economic state of the newly independent country. There was no access to proper resources, so event organizers had nothing else to do but improvise with whatever they could get out, hold of. Uh, in the 1990s, Estonian youth uh, with interest in alternative music, club music, uh, would start actively enga engaging with the nocturnal city spaces, creating their own meanings, values, and social codes of conduct. There were very few moral or legislative restrictions to regulate the emerging scene, largely because of its then miniature scale and the fact that uh, uh, the country was struggling uh, with a surge in crime rates and other problems caused by the cha chaotic situation in the society as a whole. But as the scene gained popularity in the mid 90s, it became subject to prejudices and discussions for the outgroup. This, there were several reasons uh, why the nighttime events did not meet the diurnal social and moral norms. The emergence of recreational drug use among cl club goers and non traditional codes of conduct like dancing alone and the monotonous nature of club music, uh, uh, this all began to hit the moral nerve of the public and, uh, and the legislators who were beginning to pay attention to uh, who is using the city at night and uh, how. The social co codes of the new underground scenes were not universally understandable and were morally ambiguous. Underground club culture was perceived by older generation to be based on drinking and drug use, an escape from reality without a deeper meaning. Hedonism was seen as a primary value of international youth culture. A similar judgments about urban nightlife uh, have been typical since probably the beginning of urban nightlife. Uh, historically, night has been perceived as a site of excess, uh, vice and crime. In contemporary times, urban nights are uh, portrayed as space times of transgress transgressive and antisocial behavior that need to be regulated. However, rather than simply constitute spaces of hedonism and escape, the urban night can be a site of identity transformation. Researching the 1990s Estonian Urban Night, I have found how it offered a space for young people to construct and express their identities, form social bonds and networks, and essentially create an underground music scene that over the years has grown into a unique and diverse culture that already draws uh, together different generations. Uh, public space is shaped by political and ideological processes. And its purpose today is to meet the requirements of the capital. Uh, in many aspects, uh, night spaces reflect the general ideas and values of society. Mm, night spaces are socially mediated constructs that are constituted by social struggles about what should and should not happen uh, in the dark of the night. Um, uh, people who go out at night are increasingly portrayed as problematic in discourses that involve a negative cultural signifier, uh, signifiers such as drinking, making a noise, a vandalism and hanging out in groups. The idea of all nocturnal life being essentially about hedonism, binge drinking and drug use is harmfully generalizing and makes it easy for policymakers to regulate the urban night as one homogenous uh, scene. Diverse and creative nightlife encourages engagement with the urban space and with the people who use it. So, uh, such places generally research for creative innovation in music design and different events while also helping to create a personal relationship with night and spaces uh, and the surrounding city in general. While in the mm -hmm. beginning of 90s there was very little attention paid to public spaces and its uses, after the turbulent transition period from Soviet society to democracy and market economy, economy Estonian urban night has gradually been turned into an increasing, increasingly commodified, standardized, regulated and gentrified space. 
While Estonian club culture has not been consciously anti-hegemonic in the past, I feel that there is a need for some kind of a protest or even better, a, a fair dialogue. Uh, uh, while resources seem to be plenty compared to the 90s, there seems to be less and less space for improvisation with the night. The aspect so important for creative and experimental nightlife. Uh, so I strongly relate to Chatterton and Holland's standpoint that it is important to reevaluate and reframe the debate about people and cities around concepts and policies based on inclusion, diversity, creativity, rather than more limited notions of danger, social control and regulation. Uh, it's important to understand the history, dynamics and impact of such music-based creative nightlife and analyze what can be gained or lost by heedlessly regulating or morally condemning the life at night. So uh, I will just need to use two more minutes to show you a small collage of a video installation I made for the exhibition that I, I uh, told you about before. If anyone is interested in seeing the seeing the whole work, uh, then kindly send me an email and I can give you access to it. Okay. Uh, just a second. So I will play it now. Let me know if the sound is not okay or something is wrong. Just a second. <laughs> 